Most scholars feel that Jesus was crucified and rose again in 30 AD. If that is true, there has been 1,992 annual celebrations of his resurrection. That's been quite some time now. Is it still relevant in 2022, something that happened 1,992 years ago in an ancient time in a land far, far away from here? Seems like more and more people are losing interest. The Institute of Family Studies, an article from January of this year, according to data collected in April, May of 2020 by the Barna Group, one in three practicing Christians dropped out of church completely during COVID-19. Last June, the AP broke a story about how many houses of worship in the United States have shut their doors forever due to the pandemic. What's worse, church members in the United States dropped below 50% for the first time in 2020, according to the Gallup data collected, dating back to the 1940s. For the longest time, it was 70% of Americans were going to church. If the Institute of Family Studies analysts using the American Family Studies suggest, survey suggests that religious attendance has declined significantly in the past two years, the share of regular churchgoers is down six points from 34% in 19, 2019 to 28% in 2021. It seems like celebrating the arrival of spring and getting chocolate Easter bunnies and having Easter egg hunts, uh, that's popular with children. It, I, I've eaten three bags of little Cadbury's chocolates. You know the ones I'm talking about, those little chocolate ones? I've eaten three bags of those this season. And I need to go and get a few more before they take them off the shelves. Ever notice how many of our holidays have chocolate affiliated with them? There's Valentine's Day and there's Easter and Halloween. And even Christmas has special chocolate. Easter is most definitely relevant to the retail industry. A lot of money is made this time of year. And we have uh, families over. We have wonderful dinners. And uh, that's, that's a nice thing. And that's all well and good. But none of that really has anything to do with Jesus himself, does it? The message of Jesus sometimes gets lost in the marketing. And lots of people are fine with that because lots of people have given up on Jesus. Even the name we use for this time of year, Easter, it's not a biblical term, is it? Some scholars believe the word Easter derives from the old Anglo-Saxon word Oster, which means to rise. Or it's from the term they use for the spring equinox, Ostra. So the word is fine to use, but it doesn't really put the emphasis on Jesus. Instead uh, of saying Easter Sunday, I prefer to say Resurrection Sunday, because that's more to the point, isn't it? Because that's what we're celebrating. Many people have given up on Jesus, haven't they? Even after 1992 years later. If you listen carefully today, we will learn why we shouldn't give up on Jesus. Let's continue our study in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 23. This is a small miracle that we were able to get to the resurrection of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday as we started this book many years ago. But we, here we are. Left off uh, Friday on verse, uh, Luke 23, verse 49. And let's pick it up at verse 50. A man named Joseph, who was member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plan and action, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the tomb, cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. It was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him from out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, so they returned to prepare the spices and the perfume. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandments. Interesting that Joseph is a member of the council, it tells us. A member of the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. There's 71 people on the Sanhedrin. The high priest, the vice chief justice, and 69 general members, supposedly deeply religious, all highly committed to the law and the prophets. Of the 71 only is it said of Joseph of Arimathea that he was waiting for the kingdom here. 
All along in our study of Luke, I, I have been concluding that the religious leaders were not interested in the kingdom of God. They, they weren't keen on Jesus and his works and the possibility that he was the Messiah because they were more interested in their own kingdom. They wouldn't acknowledge Jesus because he was messing up their system. I think that description of Joseph here proves my conclusion to be accurate. Only one guy on the council of 71 was truly waiting for the kingdom. The last thing Jesus spoke in the New Testament was, Behold, I come quickly. The instructions he gave his followers to watch and be ready. But it's been 1900 years since that was spoken. And lots of people have given up on the concept that Jesus is coming soon. Like the Sanhedrin, they've gotten a lot of other things to do. They got things to work on, their own kingdoms, and they're not waiting for the kingdom of God. Now, the events that have just transpired might be a good reason for Joseph to give up on watching for the kingdom of God. Jesus, the Messiah, he's dead. And the Sanhedrin were responsible. So this would not be a politically savvy move to be the only one on the council to attend to his body. I mean, it sure seems like they've proven their point. Jesus can't be the Messiah. Look, he's dead. See, Joseph, you fool. There's no kingdom. Give up on Jesus. Politically and professionally, it would be best to distance himself from Jesus. And these guys on the Sanhedrin, they're deadly. They're not a safe bunch to disagree with. They're relentlessly vindictive. Now that Jesus is dead, what more could Joseph do for him? Best to just give up on the notion that he's the Messiah. Nevertheless, Joseph has the means to get permission from Pilate to bury the body of Jesus. That's nothing Jesus' disciples could do. No, no doubt they are seen as outlaws, and they have to keep a low profile and stay out of the, you know, stay out of the view of the government officials, or they might end up on a cross too. But Joseph gets the body and he lays him to rest in his own tomb. He continues to affiliate with Jesus and goes against the other 70 members of the council. Spends his own money and his political reputation on Jesus. What is his motive for doing this? Scripture tells us he was a good and righteous man. So maybe he feels he can do some good after all this injustice that just took place. He couldn't stop the crucifixion, but at least he could do is respectfully care for the remains of another good and righteous man. Also, even though Jesus is dead, I doubt that does nothing to deter him from watching for the kingdom of God. This is a tragic event, but it does nothing to change the prophecies about the kingdom. He is going to keep trusting the word of God, despite how unrealistic it seems. And I think of all the people's reactions following the Jesus death, that Joseph is the guy that we can learn the most from. After all, our world, likewise, is full of injustice and unrighteousness. People reject Jesus and his word. Folks are giving up on him in our culture. Look around and you see that people have no interest in the kingdom of God. In all of our institutions, we see ungodly actions being promoted, perversion being taught in the schools, defended in the courts, promoted to some of the highest offices of the lands. The assistant secretary of health of our nation doesn't know his, her gender. And that's the kind of confusion that's being endorsed and celebrated by our nation's leaders. People who claim to be believers support the murder of the unborn. And when it comes to rejecting God's word and teaching contrary to what it says, so, so many so-called Christian churches are some of the worst offenders of all. Just like in Jesus' day, the religious council was the one who was most hostile to the Messiah and the kingdom of God. And I would say the same is true today. Joseph is different. And since he's good and righteous, he's watching for the kingdom. And he doesn't stop doing so even when everyone else rejects Jesus and killed him and everyone forgot what he said. And I mean everyone forgot what he said. Look at chapter 24, verse 11. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day, rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. Also other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. So when I was studying this, verse 6 and through 8 really jumped out at me. The, the angel said, he's not here, he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he's still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man would be delivered to the hands of sinful men, crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Remember? He told you all this when he was in Galilee. Remember? He told you this was all going to happen. And they said, oh yeah. So let's think about this for a moment. If Jesus had told his disciples that all this was going to happen, he told them he was going to be handed over, he was going to be crucified, and then it happened just as he said, shouldn't that strengthen their faith? Last fall, I got this really bad case of gout, and I thought, you know what, this, this is good for me, because I'm going to change my diet, and I'm going to drink lots of water, and I'm going to... Take this pain and learn from it. And I read online all the things you want, you're supposed to eat and all the things you weren't supposed to eat and everything I was eating I wasn't supposed to eat. So, you know, that was hard to back down on that. And I thought, you know, I'll change everything and I'll clear this up in a week. Well, it didn't work that fast. And it dragged on into a month. Finally, as we were heading down to Florida for the big wedding, it had kind of eased up and it was under control. But... On vacation in Florida, guess what happened? Yeah, I didn't behave so well, and it flared up again. And I said to Ileana, I can't take this for another month. So I had an online medical call, and the doctor prescribed me some meds, cost me like 10 bucks, and the pain was gone in two days. <laughs> now I know doctors don't always get it right, but when it comes to gout, they have effective medication and uh, they have a, a good cure. So I tried the natural and the holistic and I know prevention is the best strategy, but when I get a flare up, it feels like someone's sticking a knife into my big toe. I am all about the meds. The doctors were right. And since he was right, I'm more prone to believe him. I think he knows what he's talking about. Jesus has been right about everything. The angel said, remember, he told you this was going to happen. They said, oh, yeah. And what else did he tell you? That, that, that he would rise again on the third day? And this is the third day. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Now, if the disciples had truly believed all of his words back in Galilee, don't you think they wouldn't have been shocked and disillusioned when he was crucified? Couldn't they have reminded each other? This was the plan, remember? He told us he was going to be crucified. He said he would rise again on the third day. So on Sunday, hey, let's all go to the tomb and we can just pop some popcorn and we can just sit there and we can watch it happen. That's one of the reasons why I do so enjoy our sunrise services. It's very different from our other services and I hope and believe that it really helps make the point stick for all the attending, but especially our young ones, both of our Good Friday service and our sunrise service. The older I get, and now that my children are in their 20s and they can communicate with me about their childhood, they tell me the impactful things that we said in our home and the impact they had on them. And much of the things that we've done over the years at church were meaningful and impactful for them. Even when we sat outside in the cold. Remember Mike Dunn playing with his fingers numb and couldn't even strum, right? 
It, it was the fact that we were all there together practicing our faith. And by the way, that is the biggest crowd we've ever had for Sunrise Service. We had over 260 people out there. And uh, I, w- I was a little nervous that we weren't going to get that breakfast done. But let's h- give a hand to Ron and Amy and the crew. Came in and did that. That was, uh, that was a bit of a miracle. We got that done. But that we, would, we, we were all together practicing our faith. And they, my kids, when they were young, could look around at the families gathered together, our community, and we were all outside celebrating together, and it impacted them. Whoa, this is important. Now, of course, they didn't like getting up early, and of course, the cold was an obstacle, and of course, kids and teens would sooner sit at home in their PJs and eat cereal and watch cartoons, but no way that would be allowed. Something too important for all time and eternity had happened, and we got to show up and celebrate it. And from what they tell me, that had an impact on them for 1,992 years. It's been remembered and celebrated. And as long as we are here at Faith Bible Church, we will remember and we will celebrate. And we will do all that we can to drive the point home to the next generation. Remember what Jesus said. Remember what he did. If the disciples had remembered and believed, they all would have been at the tomb that morning watching and waiting for it to happen. But that's not what they did. Matter of fact, when the women came and reported the conversation that they had with the angels, the disciples, what did they think of it? They said what? It's nonsense. See, even the disciples had given up on Jesus and they weren't looking for the kingdom of God. The Messiah was dead. No point to that kingdom now. But let me just say, praise the Lord for the women. Can we give a shout out to the ladies for a moment here, for the gals, right? I mean, the disciples, they tend to get all the New Testament press, but where were they resurrection morning? It's the women faithfully going about doing the things that need to be done, tending to the relationships, dutifully preparing to honor and care for the body of Jesus. And I cannot pay enough respect to all the godly women who have continued on in these same activities, caring for the body ever since. The church is likened to the body of Christ, the Apostle Paul said. Christ is the head and we all make up the body. And in my lifetime, I have seen so many women like these gals showing up week after week to care for the body of Christ. You know, my dad was a pastor and I grew up, he was pastoring churches all over northern Maine and New Brunswick, and that had a great impact on me. But my mother organized backyard Bible clubs, just like CEF seeks to do this summer. And those two had a great impact on me. And she taught Sunday school and she sang in the choirs and did special music in church. And she made meals for hurting church members. I'll tell you this one. I've never told this story to you before. Back when I was in high school, I was the janitor in our little country church, and I cleaned it every day after school because it hosted an a elementary Christian school in that building. Anyways, I was cleaning this one day, and a lady, a church member, came in with a rifle, and she asked me how to use it. Now, this does sound a little odd, but remember, I grew up in the country, and everybody had guns. I, at 12 years old, I would take my 22 out to the woods and shoot things without adult supervision. These were different times, people, and some of you, you, you won't even know what I'm talking about. However, I was not used to seeing them in church, so that was a little odd. But Now, sons and guns, we, never mind, I won't talk about the armaments that we have at Faith Bible Church. Anyways, I showed her how to use the rifle, and I said, you're going to kill a dog or something? And she said, yeah. And left. Now, it just so happened that this lady's husband uh, had been caught molesting their foster children. And uh, my father, as the pastor, was dealing with this issue within the church leadership. And and my mom just happened to come into the church uh, shortly after that. And I told her about the lady with the gun. And she immediately put two and two together. And she went out, got in the car, and she went looking for her. And by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, she drove to the first place she suspected that gal might be. And sure enough, found her sitting in the front seat with that loaded rifle in her lap. And she went up and she knocked on that window and she said, come on, dear, give me the gun 
were going to the hospital. My mom did lots of stuff for the body of Christ that no one really knows or remembers in that congregation. But I'm telling you right now, her and millions of women of faith are going to get rewards in the kingdom of heaven. Women who show up faithfully and tirelessly to meet the needs of the body of Christ. We wouldn't be able to keep the doors open if it wasn't for the faithful gals who serve the Lord around here. And all you young ladies, I was talking about the young, the young 20-somethings here in the, out, in the, out in the sunrise service. So many of our young ladies, we see you. The church leadership sees you. We see you showing up and serving. And I remember being a small child in Sunday school, sitting on my Sunday school teacher's lap, learning the songs about Jesus and heaven. And I watched my whole life as those ladies, even up into their 80s, ladies in their 80s, were still serving children. And I see that same spirit in many of the young ladies who attend here. I'd start naming names, but I wouldn't want to embarrass them and I wouldn't want to forget anybody. But many of our young gals, they keep our ministries operational. And they do it, they do as much for that future generation as I do for those kids, their, their witness and their testimony. So the women showed up and they were the first to share the good news. Jesus is risen. Meanwhile, the hard-headed disciples thought, that's nonsense. But bless his heart, Peter, verse number 12, always a man of action. He's willing to run and check it out. Verse 12, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping, looking in, saw the linen wrapping only and went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Are there soldiers at the tomb? Well, the last he heard there was, but yet he's willing to risk himself to show up there. Peter's a, kind of an act now. Think about the consequence later kind of guy. That's my kind of guy. We'll figure out the details later. You know, let's go. And he goes and he sees the tomb is empty. Jesus had risen from the dead, which means everything he told us was true. He was the son of God. He did have power over death. And all who believe in him and follow him will inherit everlasting life. Jesus said, he declared to Martha before he raised Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He's the resurrection and the life. He's prepared a place in heaven and one day he, we will all join him. He will come again and receive us and he will inaugurate a righteous kingdom on earth. Why would we not remember? Why would we lose interest in such a great message. Why are people falling away from church? It was our intro, remember? I started my intro with that. So, my personal opinion as to why church attendance is going down in America differs from what many other people conclude. I, I read several articles and opinion pieces on the subject this week, but I didn't read one that agrees with my personal opinion. Do you want to hear my take on the subject? Okay. I think a lot of people are leaving church because many churches are not actually teaching them anything relevant. Think about this for a moment. The industry and in any industry that grows and becomes popular, the entrepreneurs that become incredibly prosperous are the ones that solve a problem. When someone sees a need and they innovate a great solution to that problem, they have something that people want. It's that simple. You solve a problem, meet a need, and you're going to be in high demand. How does that relate to church? Churches stopped solving problems for people. Churches stopped meeting the needs of Americans. They forgot what their essential service was. Churches got into the business of making people feel good about themselves. Pastors write self-help books and Denominations adopted strategies to not say anything judgmental. Qualifications of who can and cannot lead have been stripped away. Whatever church was doing that didn't make people feel good was eradicated. Clothes that made us uncomfortable were done away with. Musical styles that bored us were changed. Pews and seats and facilities were upgraded. We'll tell you how to make money. We'll provide you a place to socialize and hang out and make friends. And don't get me wrong, I'm absolutely cool with many of those changes, but here's the thing. Now we're competing with every other activity in America. 
professional sports, the music industry, Hollywood, community programs, school programs. They all do that stuff too, and many of them do it better than most churches ever could. But the one thing that should never have changed that did change was in trying to make people feel good about themselves, churches stopped dealing with the essential service of helping people out of the bondage of sin. Many churches stopped telling people they are in bondage to sin. They just tried to make people feel good about themselves in their sin. Tried to make themselves make them feel good about themselves while they're separated from God. Feel good about themselves, telling them that God would accept them because how could he not? He's a loving God. Many churches offer a form of godliness but de deny the power. The power, as Paul puts it, is I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Salvation to everyone who believes. That's the power. Salvation from sin. Sin is a real thing. It's disobedience to God. You're guilty of a whole bunch of it. And it's killing you. It's destroying your home and your relationships, your health. It's stealing your blessings. You're under a curse. But you don't have to be. We have the good news that will save from all of it. Salvation from hell. Salvation from the wrath of God and eternal damnation. That's people's problem. That's why people are leaving their churches. Their churches stopped solving an essential problem that they have. And only Jesus can solve. They stopped dealing with sin. You're going to die. You're going to spend eternity in hell. That's your problem. Your sin is killing you. And if you die in it, your soul's doomed. You're dead in your trespasses in sin, but you don't have to be because Jesus rose from the dead. He, ju just like he said he would, Jesus died for your sins. He paid the price, the penalty, the death penalty for you. And then he rose again and he offers you re the resurrection. So when you die, you too will rise again. Conquered sin and he conquered death. And he promised us if we trust in him, if we believe in him and we ask him to forgive us, he will. Everyone in America needs to hear that message. Everyone in America ought to be in a church today celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ. But since so many churches stop telling people about sin, they don't even know they have a problem. Amen. So why would they go to church if all it does is provide mediocre entertainments? This is the world we live in. People want a church that will affirm their sin. And there are many that will. There are many churches that do. They will pretend to be places to teach people about God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They're ashamed of the gospel message that people need salvation. But that's what people need, not to feel good about themselves. So we must never stop declaring the gospel. This Resurrection Sunday service, this is the first one in 15 years that our dear friend Bobby Joy was not with us. And I thought about that. I wasn't the only one because Garrett Davis brought it up outside. I was reflecting on our traditions of how we all showed up here. And I thought about him because he always showed up and celebrated with us. And we all really miss him. And the only reason why I can even bring that painful subject up in front of so many of his friends and his family is because today he celebrates the resurrection of the dead with firsthand experience. He's living it today. He's celebrating it this year in heaven with our resurrected Lord. And that is why we should never give up remembering Jesus. Everyone's dying and everyone needs resurrection. We know the way. We know the truth. We know how to inherit eternal life. John said this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. And he who has not the son of God does not have life. And we know that. And we know that Jesus is coming back again. Amen. So just like Joseph of Arimathea, we should keep watching and waiting for the kingdom of God and celebrate it every year. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you 
for celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just want to thank you so much for sending your son to be the savior of the world. Jesus, we reflected on how painful and how hard that sacrifice was. And yet out of great love for us, you gave your life, you shed your blood, your body was broken to save us from sin. And Lord, that was such a horrible thing. That was such a painful thing. Let us not be be dismissive of sin. It costs you so much, and yet we just want to act like there's no such thing. But Lord, there is, and we all need to be saved from it. And without you, we're all dying and going to hell. And we just pray that everyone would know that, and everyone would believe that, and each and every soul here, and each and every one online that would hear that message would trust in you and receive that hope of the resurrection, just as we hope for our loved ones who passed on, who trusted in you, and they're now in your presence. We long to be there. As we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin that easily besets us, looking unto the Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and we glorify you this morning, praying all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>